Yeah. Oh, kia ora te whanau. Uh, my name is Makere. I am one of the Plunkett Line nurses, registered nurse. Um, today we are talking about um, allergies talk and we have our nurse practitioner, um, Pauline Brown here. And I'm going to let her have a little chat and introduce herself. Um, and then we're going to talk about how do I know if they're having a reaction and how do I get my baby tested and all things allergies and stuff like that. Gonna chat. Yeah. Kia ora, everyone. I'm Pauline Brown. Um, I am a nurse practitioner up in Northland um, at the Child Health Centre. And I've been... Um, working with children with allergies since 1998 when I was working at um, Starship um, with that team down there and then I moved up in Northland in 2006 and we've started an allergy service up here. So I see lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of babies with eczema and allergies. So I'm hoping that I can help um, answer some of your questions this evening and um, head you in the right direction. Awesome. So take it away. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so some of the questions we've got is how do I identify an allergic reaction and what do I do if they react? Right. So an allergic reaction, what happens is that when your body uh, when your baby's body or anybody's body ha ha eats something that the that is going to cause an allergy, what is actually happening is that the body is interpreting that or thinking that it's a, a, something not good for it, okay? So even though we know that milk and egg and bread and everything is normal things for, the, for us to eat, um, when you have allergies, for some reason, the immune system is wired slightly incorrectly and it it misinterprets it makes a mistake and it thinks that that particular food is harmful for the baby so what that what 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 that mechanism or what that that immune system is doing for us is then letting you know that your child cannot have that food so you so that your child's body will then show some outward signs right so so they can uh, alert you so it's like a red flag a signal um, that something is wrong so there's a a lot of symptoms that are uh, that can happen when you have an allergic reaction okay so it can be really mild reaction and what I mean by that is you you might see some dots around your mm -hmm. baby's mouth yes. and it looks like hives um you know what little mosquito bites look like yeah, yeah. so they're raised up in their little white little dots so mm -hmm. that's that's what we call hives and so they can come up around the mouth um and or you can have some you know the lips can get puffy swelling the eyes can get puffy or you might vomit okay that's a really, really mild reaction, okay? okay? And not every reaction will get worse. It may just stay like that. And um, it, it may well just go away on its own as long as you don't give any more food, right, that they're allergic to. Um, in some cases, though, however, the reaction can be more um, severe. So we, we kind of break it up into mild reaction, a moderate reaction or a severe reaction. Yeah. So a mild reaction is what I just explained. A, a more moderate reaction, you might have hives all over your body, okay? Or you might get red all over your body. You may vomit lots. You may have more swelling, okay? So it's still, is it's still not going to harm your baby or your child but it is you know a moderate reaction and again sometimes those reactions can go away on its own but those types of reaction probably sh you should be seen by a doctor take your baby to white cross or to the hospital or if your gp is open or call plunkett line or health line because yeah 
<laughs> yeah, because, because you're going to need some advice on what to yeah. do. And they're going to they're going to ask you questions to make sure it's not the severe reaction. OK, yeah. because the severe reaction is a lot more serious. So if baby is coughing or is having difficulty breathing or fast breathing, maybe their voices change, maybe they look really pale and floppy, then that's a more serious reaction. And that requires an immediate call to the ambulance, okay? Because your baby will need, um, you know, supportive medicine for that and they'll need the team straight away. Yeah. I always say to people to try not to, put your baby in a car and drive to the hospital because you're going to be watching your baby and you're going to be trying to drive at the same time and that's not safe you're better to call the ambulance or call the helpline get help and they can talk you through it and then go to the hospital from there yeah that's perfect advice yeah okay. yeah so it can be really scary. It can be really scary the first time you ever see your child having a reaction. You know, for most, for the majority of people, they've ne they didn't even know it. They don't even know what allergies are, much less be able to deal with an allergy. Yeah. So the majority, eighty percent of um, the reactions are mild reactions. It's very rare to have a really yeah. serious reaction. So what would be your advice for a mild reaction? So if your child has had a previous reaction, mm -hmm. then your doctor or your nurse or whoever you see will have prescribed some antihistamine. Yep. So um, histamine is a chemical that gets released in the body when you have an allergic reaction. So that's what causes the swelling in the hives and vomiting and things like that so an anti antihistamine is going to stop those histamines from um uh, more reaction okay, okay. so yeah. it's gonna yeah so for very mild very very mild reaction you probably don't need to do anything except stop the food that you're giving them mm -hmm. if they've got it all over their mouth wash them off wash the food off so they're not getting any more like this yeah. Um, in them and watch them closely and you're watching for those those more severe signs so okay. larger rashes lots of vomiting or um, difficulty breathing being pale or floppy okay yep. if, it's, if you've had a reaction before you would give the antihistamine that you've been prescribed okay yeah if you had a Not severe reaction if not, you 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 would go. You would call the helpline and go to White Cross or to the hospital, yeah. or if it's in the daytime, go to your GP. Yeah. If it's a severe reaction, what do you do? Sure. Call an ambulance. Call an ambulance. Yeah. One one one. Yeah. One, yeah. One. yeah. yeah. And cool. they'll talk you through it. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, I'm just thinking. We get a few calls with the the common um reactions on Plunkett line. So that's just some really good reassurance that we're definitely doing the right things there with our assessments right. and that. So that's awesome. Right. Yeah. And yeah. there's some really good resources, uh, Makati and, and Fano. Um, you know, Allergy New Zealand is the of uh, uh, um our allergy support group. Um, so they they can always be called and looked out look on their website. Also on the pluck and Plunkett website, there's also information on allergies and with the um, Ministry of Health, it's also on there. Okay. okay, cool. I've just seen we've got a question that's come up from someone asking about mm -hmm. anaphylactic reactions. Will the next reaction also be if they are exposed? So that's a, that's a bit of a myth. Okay. Yeah. So, so how it works is if you have had a reaction and the okay. reaction is mild okay the next time the child is exposed to that food if the if they've had the same amount of food in mm -hmm. the same circumstances most definitely they're probably going to have exactly the same mild reaction okay yep. where an anaphylaxis which is the severe that's the name for the severe reaction yep. right where that may become more um, possible 
it's if you eat more of the food than you had in the first time. So let's say, um, let's take, for instance, scrambled egg. Yep. So if you had a piece of scrambled egg, um, a pea size, for instance, and you had a mild reaction, like a, a rash, mild rash around the mouth or some swelling or whatever, and you ate a pea size again, you're probably going to have the same reaction. Okay. But let's, let's say the next time the baby was exposed to egg, they put their hand in a plate of runny eggs benedict or, you know, runny, runny fried egg, and they just put the whole thing in their mouth. That is not as well cooked as a scrambled egg, and it has you've eaten a lot more. So there is the potential to have a bigger reaction because you've eaten more. Okay. okay. But there is also a possibility that they'll have exactly the same reaction again. Yeah. It's so it's so, look, it's really difficult to predict. It yeah. really is. There's no there's no one perfect answer that I can give you to reassure you. But what I but I what I can reassure you that it's a bit of a myth is that you know each time you eat the food the reaction is worse. That is not true. Okay. So what about testing? So when would a parent get the testing done and would they test? Yes, absolutely. absolutely. Yeah. So what you don't want to do is if you if you haven't had an actual reaction, mm -hmm. um, you don't want to go and ask for a bunch of random tests because a lot of um, uh, a lot of people will test children. A lot of you know possibly at your GP practice, and they may be positive, and they may be positive because your baby has eczema, but it doesn't mean that you are allergic to the food. So. There is only one real test for allergy, okay? okay and that yeah. is for food allergy, and that's eating it and then having a reaction. So the test itself is only to confirm what you already discovered when you gave your baby the food and they ate it, right? Yep. And then um, if you have another reaction, um, or, you know, over time, because a lot of these allergies will disappear. And we do yep. the test then to see if the allergy is getting better so we can guide the baby into uh, when to reintroduce the food. Does that make sense? So you would only test the foods that you've actually had a reaction to. You don't do a whole panel of food because that is very dangerous. And the reason why that's dangerous is that if any of them are positive and your baby is actually eating the food or have never been introduced to food and the food is the um, the uh, result of the skin test or the blood test is positive, you're going to have to avoid that food. But maybe they're absolutely all right with that food. Yeah. And if you avoid that food, then you can create allergies by not giving it to them. Oh, okay. So I'm going to hope that you're going to ask me about allergy prevention. Yeah. Because this leads, yeah, because this leads right into that. Yeah. But we know that there's a lot of um, whānau whose babies are going to be at risk of developing yep. allergies. So those yep. are babies who've already developed eczema. Yep. They've got family history of another yep. child in the family. They maybe have parents who have asthma, um, hay fever, eczema, or um, or food aller allergies themselves. Also, if you've migrated to New Zealand from an Asian country, um, okay. and you're coming to Western Western countries, all those people have a higher risk of developing allergies. So there's been some really, really important studies that have been done um, in the last decade. And what we know now is that uh, what we were doing in the 90s and the t early 2000s when we told people to not introduce milk until they were one, not introduce egg until they were two, not introduce peanut until they were three, yeah. probably caused more allergy than prevented it. Yeah. So what we know now is that if you are an at-risk baby, you need to introduce 
all the common food allergens before they're 12 months of age. Yep. Okay. So salt, as you know, solids can start any time after four months, but it's usually around six months. Six months, yep. Mm -hmm. And all the common food allergens, so they are milk, egg, mm -hmm. wheat, soy, peanut, tree nuts. So tree nuts, I mean cashew, walnut, pistachio, almond, hazelnut, sesame, um, and did I say fish? I can't, can't remember if I said fish. No, I so don't think all, you said fish. All those foods you introduce, like basically your baby eats what you're ever, whatever you're eating at the table yep. as, as far yep. now. And, but the important thing is to always introduce one new food at a time. So don't mash up some chicken satay with a bit of in, you know, with a wheat base batter and an egg batter. So you want to always start with a little bit and introduce only one thing at a time, give it for a few days and then introduce another new thing. Yeah, okay. and that's just with the um, common allergen foods, isn't it? Correct, correct. Yep. All the other foods. I mean, you can be allergic to anything, but those are the those are the big those are the big those are the most common, common ones yep. that we see. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Cool. Yeah, I think we had to talk about that with one of our other talks with um, those most common allergen foods, but it's always right. good to kind of right. refresh on that too. Yeah. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Because awesome. it, it's really important because. And why it links in with the skin testing or the, the allergy testing is that you don't want to test because if something comes up positive and you haven't even eaten it, it doesn't mean that you're allergic to it. Yeah. And then you're not going to give it. And then you're not going to introduce or 12 months of age. So you may, by avoiding it, you may be causing your child to become allergic. Okay, yeah. It's not 100%. It's not 100% foolproof because we still have babies who do all the right things and they still become allergic. So it's not, you know, it's not a magic, magic bullet. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. So then if they do have an allergy from our last talk, the advice was to um, make a plan with your GP or and something like that first when you go to give them the next yeah. time. And yeah, cool. Yes. And then I guess that's the talk that you would have and make sure you've got an antihistamine around and stuff like that and a plan for how you're going to reintroduce yeah. it. And yeah. yeah, absolutely. So the first point of call is your GP or your nurse yep. practitioner. Um, and um, they, you'll give them the story and depending on the severity of the allergy or how many allergies there are, in the perfect world, what they do then is refer you on to secondary services okay yep. so what that means what that means is you come to a specialist yep. so every area in new zealand has different setup okay but almost every area in new zealand has pediatricians yep. so that is that is so your gp would refer to a pediatrician okay but before he does that they they can give you give you the allergy plan they can give you the antihistamine and they can give you allergy prevention and food introduction advice yeah. okay then you go on to the specialist to then monitor the allergies so i've got little kids who have come to me at six months of age and they're still with me because their allergies didn't go away and they're 17 now oh wow right? Yeah. And then I have children who I've had, I've seen once or twice, and before they've been one year of age, their allergy goes. So there's a huge spectrum of yeah. how the allergies are going to work. Yeah. So you hear a lot of people talk about hair testing and stuff like that, those other testing for allergens. And your recommendation is to first do the foods and try them with that first. So when would you do the hair testing and or do you just, what's the advice around that? Never. Awesome. Okay. So um, hair testing is not a scientific peer-reviewed research test. Yeah. This this test will come up positive with certain things because um, it's designed to show you a whole lot of things that may not 
actually be accurate okay yeah. um, from my view it is a dangerous practice to take because you're going to a non-allergy specialist who is not is not um, trained in how to manage food allergy you're getting a test that is not bona fide it's not a true test it's not an accurate test and then you're getting advice about things that you're going to take out of the diet that can be not only detrimental to perhaps um, uh, causing food allergy but you've got a growing baby and I've, I've seen where people have been told to take out six or seven things out yeah. of their diets so yeah. they're taking milk out wheat out egg out what are you going to feed your baby you yeah. know this is this is a very dangerous and non-recommended test. So the all those um, the only tests that are are um, are recommended is skin testing, which are done either by a professional like myself or yeah. in a lab in a lab test place um, or blood tests. Everything yeah. else, no matter what it is, holding. Uh, vials of milk over your baby's body all this sort of thing is very dangerous and not yeah. recommended okay cool that's very good. strong very strong message i want to get yeah, across definitely that's awesome um so what age would they do the blood testing and the skin testing then yeah so your baby the only thing your baby is probably going to have before six months of age is milk right yep. if they're if they're on cow's milk sometimes the allergy tests in the really really young don't, are not accurate like their immune mm -hmm. system really hasn't um developed enough to create those reactions in those tests so if the baby has a reaction anytime after you know four or six months mm -hmm. uh, they can have an allergy test yeah after four to six months well when when they have the reaction i mean yep. if a baby has a if a baby has a reaction to milk um and it's a, you know one of those symptoms that i told you you know with the hives or the whatever you don't need a test really to tell you that your baby's allergic you've seen it with your own two eyes uh, but testing may may be delayed you know until they're a little bit older but you but your your whoever you've gone to see will still recommend that you don't have a formula yeah so we've got another question up it says when you say milk do you mean cow's milk dairy i do i do yeah. mean cow's milk so cow cow's milk um and so the cow milk protein is what you're allergic to and the goat milk protein is very very similar so most children who are allergic to cow's milk will also be allergic to goat's milk so goat's milk is usually not a recommended substitute for yeah. cow's milk uh, after six months of age soy milk is oh what God. we it, what we recommend under six months of age they will need to see uh, a dietitian and be put on a special formula yeah and they can that normally get a referral from a dietitian from the gp correct correct yeah, yeah. awesome anybody with cow's milk allergy should be referred to a dietitian if possible yeah mm -hmm. okay cool mm -hmm. awesome and then so how would someone get in the referral to you is that through um, like a nurse practitioner specialist is that through the pediatrician yeah. first or the no, same no, no no so what okay. happened so i'm in i'm in northland mm -hmm. um and i the referrals come through the community for from the gp okay, okay. or nurse or a nurse practitioner it goes yep. into the big pediatric pool of mm -hmm. referrals and when the pediatricians triage the referrals and they see it's uh, allergy they flick it to me and yeah. so I do the triaging, and the, we we we're not taking referrals from Plunkett at the moment. And the reason for that is is that we need to communicate immediately to the GP about doing the allergy plans, doing yeah. the um, you know getting pre testing and things like that. So what we would encourage if you, if any Fano out there is going to their Plunkett, and they, Plunkett nurse and they think they've got allergies. Um, 
your plunk your your plunket nurse can either have a chat to your GP or ask you to go make an appointment for the, with GP and get it going like that. Mm. Yeah, awesome. Cool. I think um, we kind of answered all of our questions we were going to talk about with like history of, um, you know, the siblings and that, the genetics of having allergies and stuff like that. And I'm just trying to think what other questions we had. Oh, there was one here about what about rubbing food on the skin? Is that a good way to test for an allergy? I'm pleased you said you asked that as well. So a lot of people do that and you can get a reaction, particularly mm -hmm. if you, your baby's got eczema because your baby's skin is not functioning well because they've got eczema. So if you rub if you rub a food like, say, peanut butter on the skin, um, the skin may become irritated because our skin is not where food is meant to go. Food is meant yep. to go in here and down in the gut okay yeah. so only food that's in that goes in the gut is what you can make a judgment over whether they have reactions or not so rubbing food on the skin is not a good indicator yeah and 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 that and that raises another really important thing is that a lot of people put creams natural creams on baby skin that contains food so oh, like okay. coconut oil, aveno, yeah. aveno with oat in it and uh, other things that's got peanut oil in it, the old um, cast, castor, um, castor, not castor oil, ca um, what's the bun cream, the nappy cream? Um, Popo. No, 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 oh. the, white, the white one, the white cream. It's actually got peanut oil in it. Oh, um, I can't think at the moment. I want to say castor oil, but it's not castor oil. It'll come to me. So you, particularly if your baby has signs of eczema or you have family history of eczema, you don't want to put any cream on the skin that has food in it. So look at the ingredients. You're better off going to the, the your GP and he will prescribe you a bland medication, bland yeah. cream that doesn't have any food in it. Yeah. Oh, okay, so that's like that Aveno oats one in that because that's quite a popular one and they say that oats mm. and that's quite good because it's soothing for the skin. I know. Um, and we are seeing oat allergy, so um I I would caution yeah a bit about that. Yeah. I mean lots of kids get away with it, and I know that e Aveno is very, very popular. And I, you know, I use it myself. I, I I love it. It's it's great, but it just makes me a bit nervous because it does contain oat. Mm. Yeah. Hmm. Okay, so your your recommendation would be to see the GP and get some non yeah. fragrant kind of natural natural yeah. kind of yeah. yeah, if it smells nice, if it smells nice, it probably got perfume in it. And if it's got yeah. perfume in it, it's going to irritate eczema. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Or got oh. food in it. Yeah. <laughs> you know, something <laughs> yummy smelling like coconut. Mm. Yeah. So while we're talking about eczema a bit, would so those allergen foods that we're giving baby, you know, avoiding, are they, could they be triggers for the eczema as well? Yes. So that's a whole... Different. I don't think I know that, yeah. Sorry. But so I'll just briefly touch on it because I know that there's a lot of babies out there in this situation. There's two different types of allergies. One is an immediate allergy where you get those hives or you get the lip swelling mm -hmm. and you get, um, you know, and, and it's possible to get the very more severe reaction. But we also see allergy that we call delayed allergy. Another name for it is non-IgE. So it's not an immediate immune system um, reaction. Yeah. It's a delayed one. And what we see is that babies eat the food and either six hours later, or 12 hours later, or 24 hours later, the eczema flares. Yeah. Right. Um, or they're really spilly or they have yucky poos with you know, mucus in them and they're really upset and they're really unsettled. We, we do see a lot of that and that is allergy in its sense, but it's not the allergy, as I said, in, you know, that gives those immediate worrisome reactions. Yeah, but those, mild, moderate yeah, and those, severe reaction, yeah. 
but those reactions are really real the, the yeah. ones that um, the unsettled baby and my advice is do not remove anything from the diet unless you're absolutely sure that that's the trigger if you can't resist and take my advice <laughs> then if you take something out of like say the mother's diet because she's breastfeeding mm -hmm. because we yeah. know it can go through the breast milk as well or out of the baby's diet only do it for two weeks two okay? weeks two okay. weeks and you need to totally take it out so it's no good to just not give them a glass of milk but give them ice cream or yogurt um okay um sorry my dinner <laughs> um so um um you need to take it out for two weeks observe do, do that does that eczema settle down with that milk taken out or that egg taken out okay does the spilling um decrease does the do, do the poos look better you know yeah and if your answer is a hundred percent oh my goodness oh my goodness yes it definitely made a difference then you can keep it out talk to your gp get a referral to see a dietitian yeah if it doesn't make any difference you need to put it back into the diet asap yeah. and don't take it out and then maybe think about something else that yeah. um you, it might be triggering it but a lot of people get caught up in elimination diets that are really stressful you know and and it could be detrimental to the baby's nutrition because you're taking that particular food out so you really need some good guidance on if you're going to start you know playing around with with diet like that yeah yeah that's definitely and, and, right you know, and, plunk, and, and you guys at plunkett would be the perfect people to talk about that because yeah. you, know, you 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 can give some excellent advice on that and if it needs to be taken further um then you know where to go yeah we don't want to stop mm. our mummers from having their coffee in the morning with a little bit of milk in it if no, they don't have no. to <laughs> absolutely you know or a little bit of chocolate <laughs> hard enough having a baby who's grumpy and grizzling and has got eczema and you know, if you're trying to manipulate that diet on top of all of that, that's man, you don't you don't want to do yeah. that if you don't have to do it. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. I think so we have another it's, some, it's it's somewhere in the vicinity of sixty-five to seventy-five percent of eczema is not affected by the food that you're eating. It's eczema that just needs to be controlled. A lot of people get really caught up on thinking it must be something that they're yeah. feeding the baby. Yeah. But it's but it's often not. It's more often not than it is. So keep 65 that in mind. 75 to 70%. Wow. 75% is not yeah. got anything to do with the food you're consuming. It's a dysfunctional skin barrier. And yep. what you want to do is fix the skin by the moisturizers and yep. the, the steroids and bathing. Yep. And, and yeah. Cool. Um, what was the next question we have here? Antihistamines and um, which would be the best, which antihistamine would you suggest? Yep. So um, the, the, the generic name is cetirazine. Yep. So that comes in like histoclear, zista, there's all sorts of names. But if you look at the, the box, cetirazine, and it comes in a liquid and it comes in tablets. Mm -hmm. um, but um, your GP for the little ones, you know, for the under two year olds, it really needs to be prescribed by your GP to make sure you get the right dose for the yeah. right. There's loratadine um, is another one, like so, um, loratab, loratadine is absolutely fine as well. There's some evidence maybe that the cetirazine works a little faster and a little better, yeah. but e you know, either or. Um, one that you don't want to give is uh, Fenugan um, in an allergic reaction because that's an old antihistamine. It makes you sleepy, so yeah. you don't want you don't want to give a sleepy medicine to somebody who's having a an allergic reaction because you're going you, the symptoms are going to be um, um, going to look different because you don't know if they're sleepy from the medicine or sleepy from the actual allergic reaction. So those non-drowsy kind of antihistamines. Yeah. 
definitely non yeah 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 okay um we were told yes ceratazine is not a good antihistamine to give yet other doctors told us it is um yeah so look every all health professionals have a lot of different experiences with things and um of course our lovely gps have to know so much about everything and i just need to know about allergy and eczema yes yeah, <laughs> so that's I, right <laughs> So you know, I'm 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 very lucky in that I I just get to to know all all the things about one or two subjects. So yeah, uh, I just want to uh, reassure people that um, the loratadine or the cetirizine is fine, but I tend to skew to the cetirizine. Yeah, awesome. Yeah, cool. Well, I think I, don't, I can't see that we have any more questions. Was there anything else that you wanted to add? Um, I suppose the take home message is, you know, allergies are a lot more common than they yep. used to be. We know that one in 20, 25 kids um, have allergies and they're not all, they're all, it's not all doom and gloom because we know that 80% of children who have um, the common food allergies will grow out of them. There's only 20% yep. of children who um, have them lifelong. And we yeah. know that there's less than 1% have serious anaphylaxis, okay? Yeah. And if your child does have uh, the risk of having an anaphylaxis, EpiPens have just been funded by- Oh, that's amazing. It's changed, it's changed wow. a lot. Yeah. yeah. So every child is their first prescription uh, if you're over 7.5 kilos, you can have an EpiPen and you get two, two EpiPens in your first prescription. And then if you use one because you needed it or it expired, you just go back and to your doctor and get another one. Awesome. Cool. So that is that. Yeah. So, um, and there's lots and lots of research going on out there about yeah. trying to prevent and cure allergies people may have heard a lot about you know giving a little bit at a time and um it's called oral immunotherapy that is still very 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 much in the research um, domain and we yeah. won't be seeing anything like that happening in new zealand as a regular treatment possibly never possibly in the future but there's lots and lots of research being done to help children with food allergies Cool. And I guess um, what we could also do is put a lot of these um, links and that and information. And maybe if you've got some, you know, resources out there, we could put them on the Facebook page Absolutely. for people to check so, out. So at on this on the Allergy New Zealand website, the Starship website also mm -hmm. has. So, as you know, I belong to um, a Pediatric Society Clinical Network group. And all the resources that we have um, promote or link to are all on the Allergy New Zealand website. It's also yep. on the Ministry of, of Health, and it's also hopefully getting its way to Plunkett. And there's also the other major one, which I'll give you, which has got a lot about the allergy prevention. Uh, we have um, um, a group called ASCIA, A-S-C-I-A. And I see somebody's put up um, a, a website for food allergy. But yep. the ASCIA one, um, many of the, the links that you'll see in New Zealand are linked to the ASCIA. And it's an Australasian society for immuno uh, allergy. So it's New Zealand and Australia. And mm -hmm. we and we um, rely very, very heavily on that organization to put all the most recent um, information on it. So if I know are looking for the most up-to-date and the most researched information, um, if you make your way to one of the New Zealand websites and get onto the Ask You website, it'll be all there for you. So that was ASCIA? Yes, Askia. Beautiful. I think I might look that up afterwards. Yeah, 
Australasian Society for Clinical Immunology and Allergy. So oh. it's a big festival. And yeah. somebody's just put it on. And there is a whole uh, pages and pages and pages uh, of, for patients and consumers, uh, videos to watch, uh, links, um, training courses to to make sure you know how to manage your baby's allergy or anaphylaxis. It is. Oh, that's awesome. It's so much on there. Yeah. yeah, it's it's what I call it. You know, it's our Bible, really. That's yeah, where we go. I was just about to say that. It sounds yeah. very important. Yeah. yeah, it's like our Plunkett line manual. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Awesome. Mm. Oh well, it has oh, been an absolute helpful. pleasure. Yeah, it has been. I've learned quite a lot, and I'm very thankful that you were able to do this with us today. Um, yeah. So thank you for that. I'll let you go and have your dinner. I think um, <laughs> you must be ready now. <laughs> Yes. Um, good so. luck, everyone, and um, I hope yeah, I hope you got lots out of it. And um, just just work with your GP and your and your Plunkett nurse and yeah. um, your practice nurses, and get the referrals if you need them. Um, yep. And there's people, lots of people out there that can support you. Yeah, um, Plunkett line is twenty four seven. Um, our phone number is oh eight hundred nine double three nine double two. We have lots of different Plunkett nurses, registered nurses that have so much knowledge, and um, we're twenty four seven. So far, I can call any time. Okay. Cool. Okay. Right. Thank I'll you. Sign off. Thank you. Awesome. Kakete. Kakete.